Welcome to the practice test video for the intake and mentoring system. We'll work through about 20-25 practice questions that go over all of the different topics for the intake and mentoring system. And these are just questions that I've used on past exams. So they're typical questions that you would see on an exam. Um, I'll help you go through each question and reason through it so that you guys can help improve your test taking skills. So number one, each of the following is a function of the integumentary system, except, so before you look at the answers, think what are the functions of the integumentary system, right? Protection, body temperature regulation, production of melanin, production of keratin, production of vitamin D3, um, sensory information, all of this should be in your head. Okay, so all of these are functions of the integumentary system, except protection of the underlying tissue, that's absolutely one of the functions. Production of keratin and melanin, the skin does that. Maintenance of body temperature, the skin does that, right? The skin um, sweats to cool the body down. Synthesis of vitamin C, uh, that does not make sense to me. Vitamin C is important for collagen synthesis, so vitamin C is related to the skin, but the integumentary system does not produce vitamin C. None of the above, because all of the above are functions of the skin. So the answer here, D. The integumentary system is not involved in the synthesis of vitamin C. Now, if that said vitamin D3, then that would be a function of the integumentary system. So in that case, E would be the answer. Okay, but right now, vitamin C is not um, one of the functions of the integumentary system. Which of the following is or are true of the epidermis? So think about it first and remember that the epidermis is the most superficial layer or the top layer of the skin. Remember that the epidermis has four or five layers depending on if it's thick skin or thin skin. Remember that the epidermis is made out of epithelial tissue, so it's avascular. Um, all of these things should be in your head before you even look at the choices. So which of the following is true? It is made out of connective tissue? No. Right? We just said it's epithelial tissue. Specifically, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The dermis and hypodermis are connective. It's the outermost layer of the cutaneous membrane? Yes. If the epidermis is the top layer, you're looking at my epidermis right now. So that's true. Let's keep looking at them. It contains the smallest vessels, which are capillaries. No, epithelial tissue is avascular. That means it has no blood vessels. Not big ones, not medium ones, not small ones. No blood vessels are present in the epidermis. The blood vessels stop at the top of the dermis. So that's not true. It's made of simple squamous cells. Don't be tricked there. It is made out of squamous cells, right? It's epithelial tissue, but it's stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So that is not correct. It's not one layer of cells. It's multiple layers of cells. So which of the following is true? Uh, B, it's the outermost layer of the cutaneous membrane. Which of the following is arranged from the most superficial to the deepest layer? So when we talk about the integumentary system, we mentioned the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Remember, the uh, most superficial means the outermost. So the top layer is the epidermis, right? then the dermis, then the hypodermis. So epidermis, dermis, hypodermis, yes, that makes sense. Um, the rest of them do not make sense. So you have to know what superficial and deep means. Um, and you have to know which is the top layer, which is the middle, and which is the deepest layer. Realize this could be asked in multiple different ways. Right? We could put specifics in there. Like we could talk about the papillary layer of the dermis and the reticular layer of the dermis. Um, instead of saying hypodermis, we could say the subcutaneous 
layer. So there are lots of different ways that you could arrange this, but understand the layers um, and what order they're in. Epidermal ridges. Again, think about this before you look at the choices. So when we look at the line between the epidermis and the dermis, it's not straight, right? Remember, there's a curvy line that you see when you look at the skin on the microscope. There are curves between the epidermis and the dermis. Those curves are because there are projections of the epidermis that reach down. We call those epidermal ridges. And there are parts of the dermis that go up. Those are dermal papilla. Okay, so epidermal ridges and dermal papilla interlock, and that creates that curvy line. And we said that that increases the surface area, so that increases the strength between the two layers, right? The more surface area, um, the more hemidesmosomes, like little staples, to hold the two layers together, right? So epidermal ridges allow for increased strength of attachment between the dermis and epidermis, yes. Right? More surface area, more hemidesmosomes, stronger attachment. They increase the surface area, that's what we just said, right? So increased strength, yes. Increased surface area, yes. Cause ridge patterns on the surface of the skin, yes. Remember we said the specific pattern of these epidermal ridges are what determine our fingerprints, right? The fingerprint pattern or the swirl pattern on our palms and on our feet. Um, so this is causing our fingerprints. So A, B, and C are all correct. And look, we have a choice of all of the above. The layer of stem cells that constantly divide to renew the cells of the epidermis is the this should pop into your head right off the bat as the stratum basal. Again, the epidermis is divided up into layers of cells and the deepest layer or the most, um, the bottom most layer is the stratum basal. And the stratum basal is filled with basal cells. These are the cells that just divide and divide and divide and make more and more cells. And those cells get pushed up and up and up to eventually replace the cells that we're losing. We're constantly losing skin cells, right? If I scratch my arm, I have a ton of skin cells underneath my nails right now. Um, so we have to replace those cells from somewhere. The way we replace them is that the cells in the stratum basal, the basal cells, divide continuously. What's the function of keratin? So remember that keratin is a protein and we have a lot of keratin present in our skin. Um, when we look at the skin, uh, we call the cells that are present in the epidermis keratinocytes, right? keratin cells, because they end up being dead cells that are just packed with a bunch of keratin. And that keratin is important for the function of the skin or the, the protection that the skin gives us. So what's the function of keratin? Remember, keratin is really strong so it protects from abrasion, from scratching or tearing or breaking of the skin, and it's water resistant. So because it's water resistant, it helps to stop water from crossing the skin, um, either evaporating out of our body, right, or water entering our body. Right? It helps to stop water from crossing over the epidermis. So it's water resistant and it's resistant to abrasion. So what's the function of keratin? Keratin makes the skin resistant to abrasion. Yes, we said that's true, but let's keep reading in case. Um, makes the skin flexible and elastic. No, okay, keratin's kind of the opposite. Keratin makes it strong. Um, elastin or elastic fibers make the skin flexible and elastic. We do have elastic fibers present down deeper in the skin. And that's why you know we can move our skin and it snaps right back to normal but that's not keratin makes the skin water resistant yes we said that that was true right that's what makes the skin a good barrier to water is all of the keratin that's present protects the skin from uv radiation no what's that hopefully you guys said melanin um, melanin is the pigment that protects from uv radiation so a and c were both correct here and my answer would be B. 
Again, always be thinking of ways that these questions could be asked. I like to twist things into clinical situations. Okay, so if I ask you about a patient who is unable to make keratin, think about what symptoms would they show? It's in the skin. Their skin wouldn't be water resistant. Their skin would not be resistant to abrasion. Okay. Um, or think of the opposite, right? Or if I said, a patient who was unable to make elastic fibers, what would their results be? Or a patient who's unable to make melanin, what would their results be? Okay, I always be twisting these questions around to think of how I could ask them. Speaking of a patient, look at number seven. While walking barefoot on the beach, Joe stepped on a thorn that penetrated through the sole of his foot to the dermis. Which statement is true? So first off, he's walking and the thorn penetrated his foot. That gives you a clue right there that you're talking about thick skin. Remember, most of your body is covered with thin skin, but the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet have thick skin. So the epidermis is different in thick skin you know that the epidermis has a thick stratum corneum, so the outer layer is much thicker, and you know that it has an extra layer called the stratum lucidum. So right off the bat, thick skin, because it's the foot. Um, it also says that the thorn penetrated through um, to the dermis, right? So through the sole of his foot to the dermis. If it made it to the dermis, that means that the thorn had to go all the way through the epidermis. They penetrated completely through the epidermis. If it just made it to the dermis, that means it has not gotten to the hypodermis yet. Okay, so the hypodermis is untouched. Let's look at our choices. A, the thorn went through four layers of epidermal skin. No. If we would have, or the patient would have gotten um, stabbed in the arm, or the belly, or um, the leg, then yes, there would have been four layers of skin or four layers of cells in the epidermis, but it was the foot. Thick skin has five layers, okay? So no, A is not true. The thorn went through a thick stratum corneum. Yes, it did. Thick skin has a thick stratum corneum, right? Instead of say 20, 30 layers of cells, it has a hundred layers of cells or more. So B is true, yes. The thorn stopped at the dermis, so it did not cross the epidermis. No. Um, if it made it to the dermis, it had to go through the epidermis. The epidermis is on the outside. The thorn did not cross a stratum lucidum. That is also not true. If the thorn went through all of the epidermal layers, then it went through the stratum lucidum um, because we're talking about thick skin. Okay. Young Dima, no. Um, so the answer was B, that it went through a thick stratum corneum. <clears throat> which of the following, or which of the skin's touch receptors, okay, so sensory receptors that provide information on what we're touching, can we find in the epidermis? So we talked about three different types of sensory receptors or touch receptors. We talked about um, Merkel cells okay, or tactile, um, or we talked about Merkel cells. We talked about tactile corpuscles. And then we talked about Pacinian corpuscles, which are also called lamellated corpuscles. Only one of these is present out in the epidermis. And that one is the Merkel cells. Okay, Merkel cells are our small, really sensitive sensory receptors that we find only on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet because those areas need to be extra sensitive to touch. When we go down deeper um, into the dermis and even towards the hypodermis, that's where we see our corpuscles. That's where we see the tactile corpuscles and then even deeper we see Pacinian corpuscles, which remember we also call lamellated. Okay, so the answer here is A. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause here so that the video is not too large of a file and then I'll start part two.